Yes, hope you can join us for that exciting occasion. Well, you may have noticed, we hope you had a great uh, break over October break here. It seems to come at a really good time. Now we're back and uh, for the next leg of this semester uh, through Thanksgiving. You may have noticed today when you walked in that chapel looks a little different. Uh, that's because uh, we have a different kind of chapel today. Uh, today we have with us um, a representative from uh, Jews for Jesus. Uh, his name is Andrew Barron and he is uh, the director of Jews for Jesus in Canada. He lives in Toronto. Yeah, we have a bunch of Canadians here to, to welcome you today. Uh, Andrew uh, became a Christian while he was at the Florida Institute of Technology. Uh, he had a friend that shared a Gideon New Testament with him and challenged him to read it, and he became a Christian through that experience. Uh, he used to work uh, with an early space shuttle mission. So he, he has this really interesting past, but since 1993, he's worked with Jews for Jesus, serving in Los Angeles, Boston, Johannesburg, and he's been in Canada since the late 90s. Um, he's going to talk a little bit more about that today, but he's here today to share with us this presentation about Christ in the Passover. Uh, many of you celebrate communion in your churches, and maybe you don't know the historical tie-in. If you're taking Old Testament or New Testament classes now, maybe you'll see some new things. Remember, one of the roles of chapel is for us to understand that there's diversity in our Christian faith, but there's also historical roots to our Christian faith. And today he shares with us this whole Seder feast, the Passover dinner, and, uh, and gives us a sense of how that impacts and how that informs our Christian faith. So let's welcome uh, Andrew Barron uh, from Jews for Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor John. Shalom. Well done. I'm Andrew Barron. I've actually been serving the Lord with Jews for Jesus since 1983. So 34 years served uh, here and all over the world. Many people don't understand Jews for Jesus. They think that it's an oxymoron, a contradiction. I guess it's something like vegetarians for roast beef. But we proclaim Jesus as the Jewish Messiah the one that Moses and the prophets spoke about. And as Pastor John said, I was walking across campus one day. I was a graduate student at Florida Institute of Technology. And as I walked into the student union, I got this. This is the actual Bible I was given in 1981. I knew what it was. It was a book for Christians. It wasn't a book for Jews. And I wanted to get rid of it. I had a friend. I knew that she was religious. She walked around with a cross and carried a Bible. I went up to her office and I said, hey, Dr. Petty, the Gideons are downstairs handing out these Bibles, and I got one, and I reached across her desk, and I said, here, it's for you. And she said the strangest thing. She said, no, Andrew, it's for you. And then I thought to myself, oh, I realize why she said that. She doesn't realize that I'm Jewish. So I'm going to tell her that I'm Jewish, and she'll apologize to me, and she'll take this Bible off my hands. So I said, oh, Dr. Petty, I guess you don't realize I'm Jewish. And then she said the strangest thing. She said, well then, Andrew, this book is especially for you. <laughs> she said, this is a Jewish book written by Jews, for Jews, about a Jew named Jesus. And that was the beginning of the end for me. Eventually coming to put my faith and trust in Jesus a year or so later and uh, began serving with Jews for Jesus in 1983. And I'll tell you more about our ministry a little bit later. But first, we're going to share together Christ in the Passover. Our Messiah, Jesus, was Jewish. And not only that, but he celebrated Passover every year while he dwelt among us. But I think you'll find that he is clearly pictured in the story of Passover, as well as all the symbols of Passover. For the story of Passover is the story of our liberation from bondage. But more importantly, the message of Passover is the promise of redemption. This morning, as I share with you this traditional Passover setting, it's my hope and prayer that you'll view it as more than just as an explanation of a commemorative meal, but that you'll view it as I do, as an object lesson on the life and mission of the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Look closely, because if you do, you'll see his death and his resurrection. You'll also see the promise of his return. I'm just going to read a few verses here from the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. Verse 7, 8, and 13 says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go, make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Verse 13 says, They left 
they found things just as Jesus told them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, the first night of Passover, which begins in the spring, begins a seven-day holiday called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. During that time, we eat nothing that contains any yeast or leaven. Why no leaven? Well, throughout Scripture, leaven is frequently used as a symbol of sin. In olden times, just a small piece of leaven was used to ferment an entire portion of dough. It was the leaven that caused the dough to rise, to become puffed up, just as sin causes us to become puffed up in our own eyes. So for this time, we eat no leaven as a way of saying that we want to break the daily sin cycle in our own lives. As a matter of fact, in many Jewish homes, for six weeks prior to the Passover, the house would undergo a complete spring cleaning. We'd remove all the cakes and the cookies, the biscuits, the bread, the cereal, anything that has any leaven in it. Now, this is usually the work of the woman of the house. But did you notice that Luke said that Jesus sent two men to prepare the Passover? Now, perhaps he sent two men because in Judaism, it's the man who is standing before God, not only when it comes to praying, but when it comes to ceremonial preparation as well. So if you really think about it, it should be the man who's cleaning the house for these six weeks. Well, some guys think, well, there's got to be a loophole there somewhere. Well, there is, fortunately for us. We've come up with a unique solution to this very delicate problem. True, we say the house is spotless because for the past six weeks, it's been cleansed of every single speck of leaven. Well, almost every speck. You see, what happens is, is that the woman will hide a few crumbs of leaven somewhere in the house, and it's up to the man to find them. So the night before Passover, the man, return homes, the man returns home from work and takes up some strange-looking cleaning tools. A wooden spoon, a white feather, and a white cloth. And he goes throughout the house on what we call in Hebrew, Bedikat Chametz, the search for the leaven. But where could the crumbs be? Anywhere, in the attic or behind a refrigerator, under a table, anywhere. But fortunately for him, his wife has been good enough to hide those crumbs the same place she hid them the year before. So it's without too much difficulty that the man would finally discover those crumbs and with a steady hand sweep the crumbs into the spoon with the feather. Now, since these crumbs represent sin, the man is not permitted to touch them. So he takes the whole thing, and he wraps it in the cloth. Now he takes this down to a large bonfire that's burning in the courtyard of the local synagogue. All the men of the community have gathered there, and each one would throw his bundle of leaven into the flame. Then the man will proudly return home, where he'll then declare, Now I have purged my house of all leaven. The house is cleansed. It's now ready for the Passover celebration. If you remember from the book of Exodus, the children of Israel were instructed to eat that first Passover meal in great haste, right? The scripture says that their loins had to be girded up, their stabs in their hands, their sandals on their feet. They were ready to go out of the land of bondage at a moment's notice. But today at Passover, things are different, and we would relax at the table and recline on pillows. You see, in ancient Near Eastern societies, only people who were free could recline at the table, only people who were already redeemed. Also, the head of the house would wear these special ceremonial garments. The father would wear a white robe like this, which is called a kittle. Now, it's white because in Jewish tradition, white is often seen as one of the colors of royalty. Also, Jewish men often cover their heads as a sign of respect before God. But today at Passover, instead of wearing the usual yarmulke or skull cap, the man would wear something a little more elaborate. So you see the father wears these royal robes, but this, which is a symbol of a crown, a crown. Because today at Passover, the head of the house is a king. And as a king, he would lead his family through the Passover Seder. Seder is a Hebrew word which means order because the Passover Seder follows a specific order of events which is found in this book which is called the Haggadah which means the telling, the telling of the story of Passover. The Passover would begin with the lighting of the candles. 
Now, this is usually the duty and the honor of the woman of the house. Now, after she lights the candles, she would recite a traditional Hebrew prayer. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech olam, asher kitshanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu l'hadlik ner shel Pesach. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to light the Passover candles. It's significant for us that a woman lights the candles. It reminds us that the Messiah, who is called the light of the world, would come to us not by seed of man, but by seed of woman and the will of God. Just as the prophet Isaiah foretold. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. He would be a light, a light to light the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. Passover is not just a meal, it's a banquet. Not just a service, but a celebration. While a meal and service may take an hour, the Passover celebration will take four hours. During that time, each adult will drink and refill his cup four times. Four cups to commemorate God's fourfold promise to the children of Israel. He promised that he would be their God, that they would be his people, that he'd bring them out of the land of bondage, and that he would place them in the place of his promise. Four cups, four promises. The first cup is called the Kiddush cup, the cup of sanctification. The second cup, this is called the cup of plagues, the cup of plagues. Now the third cup is the focal point of the entire evening. It's the cup taken after dinner is served called the cup of redemption. The final cup is called the cup of Hallel, or the cup of praise. It's with the first cup, the Kiddush cup. The host offers a blessing for the rest of the evening to come. Holding the Kiddush cup aloft, he thanks God Almighty, King of the universe, who has created the fruit of the vine. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech olam borei peri hagafen. Amen. So the service has now officially begun. A child stands up to ask the meaning of Passover. He or she would recite the traditional four questions of Passover, which are found in the Haggadah. The first question is this, why? Why is this night different from all other nights? Those of us who know the story of Passover are obligated to respond to the question. And we say, this is because of what the Lord did for us when he brought us out of the land of bondage. We say it's when the Lord redeemed us we say it's when the Lord redeemed us with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm. You see, redemption, it comes up over and over again. Redemption is the very heart of Passover. But Passover imparts to us more than God's message of redemption. Passover imparts God's means of redemption. His means of redemption which was accomplished through the sacrifice of a spotless Passover lamb. If you remember from the book of Exodus, the children of Israel were instructed, take a whole spotless lamb, roast it without breaking its bones, then take the blood of those lambs and apply it to the doorposts of your houses. So they took the blood of the lamb, they put it on the top of their doorposts, and they took the blood of the lamb and they put it on the two side posts. And because of their obedience to that command, but more importantly because of their faithfulness, their faithfulness in the effectiveness of that provision of blood, they were spared, weren't they? For when the angel of death, the tenth and most terrible plague, came upon Egypt at midnight, and when the angel of death saw that blood on the doorposts of the houses of the children of Israel, the scriptures tell us that death was forced to pass over. That's where we get the name Passover. In Hebrew, the word is Pesach, the holiday which commemorates the time when death literally passed over the houses of Israel because of the blood, the blood of the lamb, the spotless Passover lamb. What a mighty act of redemption. But still, it's a picture for us. It's a picture of an even greater redemption that was still far off and hoped for and longed for. For just as none of the bones of those first spotless lambs were to be broken, so too none of Jesus' bones were to be broken in his death. And just as the children of Israel had to apply in faith, didn't they? They had to apply in faith the blood of the spotless lamb to the doorposts of their houses, trusting that death would pass over. So too must we apply in faith the blood of the lamb, 
That is the blood of the new covenant shed on the cross of Calvary. We take that blood and we apply it in faith as well to the doorposts of our heart and our souls, trusting as well that death will pass over. It's by the blood of the Lamb, isn't it, that Israel was redeemed. And by the blood of the Lamb does God continue to work, even today, even now. The child then asks the second question. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? And we respond and we say, this is because our ancestors, in their great haste to leave Egypt, had to take their bread with them while it was still flat. Now this is what's called a matzah tosh. It's a pouch which contains three layers of matzah, three layers of unleavened bread. Inside the pouch, each layer is separated by a small piece of cloth. At this point in the service, the father would expose and remove the middle layer of unleavened bread. He'd recite a blessing and break it in two, set one half aside. The other half, he gives a very special name. That name is Afi Komen. Afi Komen. Can you try saying that with me? Afi Komen. Good, you all speak Greek. That's a Greek word, and it means he who comes after. Well, that's precisely what happens, for something very strange is done with the Afi Komen right now. It's wrapped up in this pouch, and then it's buried hidden from view, not taken right now. But later on, the service cannot continue without it. The child then asks the final two questions. Why on this night do we eat only bitter herbs and why do we dip into salt water twice? Let me explain by showing you this. This is called a Seder plate. And despite its appearance, it is not used for deviled eggs. (laughs) A traditional piece of food from the Passover meal is placed in each one of those compartments. And each food will paint a picture of God's plans and purposes in redeeming his people. The first piece of food is called karpas, or greens. Usually we use this parsley or lettuce. Now these greens, they represent life. Life. But before we actually eat the greens, we have to dip them. We dip them into salt water, which represents the tears of life. This food reminds us that life, but a life that is without redemption is a life that is immersed, immersed in tears. The next piece of food is called katseret, which is the root, the root of the bitter herb. Usually we use an onion, sometimes a horseradish root. This food reminds us that the root of life is often quite bitter, isn't it? As it certainly was for the Israelites while they were in bondage and and bondage and slavery to Pharaoh. The root of life is bitter. Life without redemption is immersed in tears. The next piece of food is the bitter herb itself. It's called maror. We use freshly ground horseradish. Now the Haggadah instructs all of us that we're supposed to eat a tablespoon of horseradish. Any volunteers? Now you know what happens when you eat a tablespoon of horseradish. You cry, right? As a matter of fact, you have absolutely no choice in the matter. This is between the horseradish and your sinuses, and the horseradish always wins. But there's a serious side to the tears. The tears which you are commanded to shed are there to remind you how bitter and filled with tears your life would be without redemption. By way of contrast to that, this is the food that's called charoset. It's the food that reminds us of the mortar. The mortar that the children of Israel used to make bricks for Pharaoh. We take chopped raisins and nuts and honey and apples and mix it into a paste and eat it with some unleavened bread. And as you can imagine, this tastes sweet. So the question is why? Why are we using a sweet mixture to represent such a bitter toil, a bitter life? Why are we using a sweet mixture to represent the bitterness of the life and labor of Israel on behalf of Pharaoh? Why a sweet mixture? The Haggadah tells us the answer. It tells us that even the hardest and the bitterest of life, and even the hardest and the bitterest of labor, is still sweetened with the promise of what? Redemption. Before the Passover meal is to be eaten, we have to eat an egg. But the egg is given a special name. That's the name Chagigah. The Chagigah was the name given to the special temple sacrifice when the temple stood in Jerusalem before the year 70 AD. We take eggs that are white. We roast them in the oven, which turns them brown. 
Then we open the egg up and give a little bit out to each person at the table. But before the egg is eaten, we have to dip it into salt water, which represents what? Tears, right. The Chagigah is a token of grief, as we remember the destruction of that temple in the year 70 AD. But it's not just a token of grief, it's a symbol of hope and new life, because inside every egg is still the hope and the promise of new life. The final item is a bone. This is the shank bone of a lamb. Passover is called the feast of the Passover lamb. But today at Passover, lamb is not served. That's because in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed, and along with it, the altar onto which the sacrifices were made. So from that time to this day, no sacrifice is made, no lamb is served. The presence of the egg and the bone brings to mind sacrifices, which are no longer made. But more importantly, the presence of the egg and the bone brings to mind an interesting question. With no temple, no altar, no sacrifice, how was forgiveness then possible? You see, the law of Moses was very clear about this. God spoke to his people through Moses in the book of Leviticus and said, I have given it to you on the altar to make the atonement. Now, some people might say, yeah, well, maybe that was important 2,000 years ago, but it can't be important today. Well, in principle, it must, because the scriptures tell us that we have to take the story of Passover personally, as if each one of us are being counted as one of the children of Israel being redeemed from the land of bondage. We're supposed to take the story of Passover personally, as if we experienced it ourselves, because each one of us needs to be redeemed personally. These items, they just don't speak about a people who lived in the ancient Near East, do they? No, this is us. This is about us. This is our pain and our heartache and the root of our bitterness, but also our joy. This is our narrative as well, isn't it? But with no temple, no altar, no sacrifice, how is that redemption possible? With no Lamb of God, how? Well, the New Testament gives us the glorious answer. John the Baptist was baptizing his disciples in the Jordan, and he looked up and he saw a Jewish man coming forward for baptism. And we remember what he said. His words echo throughout all eternity. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's how. Not through the sacrifice of those lambs year after year after year, but through the sacrifice of the spotless Lamb of God who was slain once and for all and forever, even before the foundations of the world, the Messiah himself, Jesus. The second cup is called the cup of plagues. In Jewish tradition, a full cup represents complete joy. But at this point in the service, our joy is incomplete, and we pour out some of the contents of the cup before we drink it, diminishing its contents, diminishing our joy. We do this ten times to remember the ten plagues that were poured out upon the land of Egypt. We mourn their loss, expressing sorrow for Egypt's destruction. But more important, we learn a tragic lesson because Pharaoh defied God. He was repeatedly told what God wanted, and he refused. And as a result, death and destruction came into his home, into his land. So if we can glean a tragic message from the story of the cup poured out, we have to glean that if God is clearly and specifically directing you, you should by all means be obedient. But today at Passover, it's a day of rejoicing, a day of thanksgiving, a day to praise God. Today at Passover, we in the body of Christ can praise God because the angel of death passed over the houses of Israel. And we can praise God because the children of Israel have been redeemed from the land of bondage. But more importantly, we can praise God because those of us who know him have been redeemed, haven't we? We've been redeemed from an even greater bondage through our faith in the Messiah of Israel. Through him and because of him, as a result of what he did on Calvary's cross, all of us can pass over, can't we? We can all pass over from death to everlasting life. Well now, in between the second and third cup, that's the time for the great Passover meal. I can't serve you one of those, but I just want to take a minute and tell you a little bit about my ministry with Jews for Jesus in Toronto and around the world. In Toronto, there's about 400,000 Jewish people. I'm part of a network of Jews for Jesus agencies and offices all over the world, 26 cities, 14 countries, reaching out to some 15 million Jewish people. Today we're seeing more Jewish people hearing and responding to the gospel than ever before. But the vast majority of Jewish people who hear the gospel hear it from people like you. Christian friends and neighbors and co-workers and classmates and peers. That's how I heard the gospel and that's how most Jewish people today are hearing as well. 
And so we'd love for you to be informed and inspired by the stories of Jewish people who are hearing and responding to the gospel. There's a table out in the lobby, and if you'd like to know more about Jews for Jesus, I hope that you can pick up some of our literature. This is an involvement card. I'd love to send you our e-blasts to keep you informed with what we're doing. And there's a large card that you can fill out with your email address and drop it in the plate, and you can receive monthly e-blasts about our ministry in Toronto and around the world. We'd also very much appreciate your prayers. The small part of the card is a prayer reminder card, and you can take that home. If you're active on social media, so are we. So please like us at Jews for Jesus Canada, and you get regular updates. There's a book there as well that I have for sale for $5. It's called Stories, Stories of Jews for Jesus. It's my favorite book because my testimony is on chapter 12. So if you like this book, it's only $5, and you can just leave the money on the table in the plate there as well. I'd love for you to be involved, to be inspired and informed, and to know more about what Jews for Jesus is doing in Jewish communities here and around the world. And so please stop and speak to me after the service if you do have time. But now, after the break and after the great Passover meal, we have to continue, and we continue with the focal point of the evening, which is the cup taken after dinner, the third cup, the cup of redemption. But the service cannot continue. Do you remember earlier something was broken and then it was buried? Well, it now needs to be brought back or the service cannot continue. Do you remember what that was called? <laughs> no, the afikomen. The afikomen. That's okay. Once I did this and somebody yelled out that it was the avocado. <laughs> so all the children search the house for the afikomen. One finds where it is and it's brought back to the father. The father unwraps it and he exposes it and then he breaks it and he breaks it into many small olive-sized pieces and this small piece is taken along with the third cup, the cup of redemption. Look familiar? Well it should for this is actually the very origin of our communion service. And not only that, where else do we get a clearer picture of our Messiah than in this tradition of the afikomen which is broken, buried and brought back. Even the matzah, which is unleavened. Remember what unleavening speaks of? Right, it's a symbol of sinless nature. We can see him portrayed in the bread, which must be striped. And this is a reminder for us, a picture for us, because Jesus was striped, wasn't he? Even as the prophet Isaiah foretold, and with his stripes we are healed. But we can also see him portrayed in the bread, which is pierced. Can you see that? And this is also a picture for us, a portrait, because Jesus was pierced, wasn't he? Even as the prophet Zechariah foretold, and they shall look upon him whom they have pierced, and they'll mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. But we can see him not only in the bread, we can see him in the pouch. Remember this pouch? Three layers of unleavened bread, each one separated by a small piece of cloth. There's quite a bit of disagreement as to the meaning of this ancient unity, this ancient three-in-one. Some people say that the unity of the pouch bears witness to the unity of ancient Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the children of Israel. Some people say that the unity of the pouch bears witness to the unity of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But why is the middle layer broken and buried, brought back? Well, nobody really knows. But then again, why even search for explanation? Why not just accept the explanation that's so clearly given in the design of the pouch itself? For there are three layers here, yet it forms a unity, a tri-unity. A Hebrew word which may mean such a unity is the Hebrew word echad, echad. That word brings to mind God's word in the book of Deuteronomy, where Moses was crying out to Israel and he said these words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. But the word that he uses for one is echad. And echad literally means a unity. So the picture that we have is of the father removing the middle layer of the echad, of the unity, of the oneness. He removes it so that he can make it visible while the other two remain hidden from view. And we know the truth of this picture from the Gospel of John chapter 1. John wrote, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. 
the word became visible, and we beheld his glory. And he came unto his own, but his own received him not. But to those who received him, he gave them the right to be called children of God, even to those who believed on his name. We Jews who know the Messiah know that the unity of this pouch bears witness to the unity of one God revealed in three persons, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Why is the middle matzah broken, buried, and brought back? I think it's a picture of our Messiah who was broken, buried, brought back. This is my body, he said, broken for all of us. Do this in remembrance of me. The third cup is red to remind us of the blood, the precious blood that was spilt by those first Passover lambs. Those lambs were sacrificed, their blood was spilt in order to redeem Israel, to buy Israel back from bondage and slavery to Pharaoh. But in the very same way, the blood of another Passover lamb was spilt, the Messiah Jesus, in order to redeem us, to buy us back from bondage and slavery to sin. That's why it was concerning this third cup, the cup taken after dinner. The scripture tells us that Jesus stood up from that last supper, a Passover meal like this one. And the scripture says that he picked up the cup after dinner and he pointed to it and he said, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The very new covenant that was already promised to us by the prophet Jeremiah. Listen to what Jeremiah wrote 700 years before. He said, behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah not like the covenant I made with your forefathers. In the day that I brought you by the hand out of the land of bondage, the covenant which you broke, although I was a husband to you. For in those days I'll put my law within you, on your hearts I shall write it. I will be your God, you shall be my people. The third cup is taken along with the broken piece of afikomen as a way of remembering the spilt blood, the broken bodies of those first Passover lambs. Our Passover lamb is Jesus. The final cup is called the cup of Hallel, the cup of praise. You know the word hallelujah. The first part of that word is the Hebrew root word, Hallel, to praise. And so we give thanks and praise to God through this cup when we see his mighty deeds of redemption. Now there's one last cup, which I haven't told you about, from which no one drinks. The cup of Elijah, the cup of Elijah. As a matter of fact, in many Jewish homes, An entire place setting is set here for the prophet Elijah. Why this longing for Elijah? Well, it's recorded in the Old Testament book of the final prophet, Malachi. Malachi tells us that Elijah will announce the coming of the Messiah. Elijah announces Messiah's coming. So at this point in the service, a child gets up from the table and goes to the front door of the house and opens the front door into the night, looking for Elijah, the prophet, hoping that Elijah would accept the invitation of the open door, enter the house, sit in his chair, drink from his cup, thereby announcing the coming of the Messiah. And we really used to do this in my home. When my sister would open up the door, I would peek over Elijah's cup and then wonder what would happen if the juice started to go down. But it never did. But then again, we know that Elijah has already come, don't we? Because when John the Baptist, spoke, when Jesus spoke about the prophet John the Baptist, he said, if you care to believe it, he himself is Elijah, the one who was to come. The prophet and the forerunner has come, and so has the Messiah. And many might look at this and say, isn't it nice the way God has revealed himself to us? God has revealed himself through history and through scripture, through symbols and through God's people. Well, I don't think it's nice. I think that when someone does you a favor, favor is nice. But God didn't do us any favors. God redeemed us from bondage and slavery to sin. Not just nice, but amazing grace. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your mighty deeds of redemption and that by the blood of the Lamb we may be bought back from bondage and slavery to sin and selfishness to to be delivered into that promised land of hope and peace and redemption. And we thank you that by the blood of the Lamb can we be bought back. And so thank you for your mighty deeds of redemption. May the Lord bless us and keep us, and may the Lord lift his countenance upon us. May the Lord bless our hearts as we continue to look to him today and serve you in all the places that you have us. And so meet us in those needs. Meet us in those places where our heart is. 
and bless us as we continue to serve you. In the strong name of Jesus, amen.